Hey. hey! There we go. Welcome to Scotch for Dummies. Four guys in the Scotch Ooh. journey to help you with your next Scotch purchase on Sunday. Welcome to Sunday. Second live Sunday I'm still getting show. used to this stuff. <laughs> it's my first one, technically. That, actually, it is. You missed out last week. And you missed he, a good he one. He just set everything up for us. Uh, <laughs> I did. Well, and it, it worked, thankfully. Um, welcome, <laughs> everybody, to Scotch for Dummies, our uh, Sunday live. We uh, have an interesting topic today and an interesting guest that actually knows a lot about the Tave goes, well, this one worked. <laughs> Imagine that. It'll be good. But um, today we're going to talk about wood and the importance uh, on the, the scotch industry and, and the wood industry, actually, you know, with the sourcing of it, how do they get it, what do they do with it when they do get it, what do they do with reuse stuff and, and how it's moved from one spot to another, what it really means, why you really should care. Uh, we actually poured a little interesting um, bottle here that we'll pull out when we get our guest on as well. But um, you want to say hi to everybody real quick? Yeah, sure. All right. I'll pull it up. Hi, okay. everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> no, uh, welcome, Facebook. Welcome, Welcome, YouTube. gentlemen. Cheers to a Sunday. I'm very interested to see what this glass brings us. Um, our guest today, we've had on the show before, over the last six years. Yep. Uh, we've Good friend of the show. We've met him a few times here, yep. there, and everywhere. He is brilliant when it comes to speaking about whiskey, about scotch. Um, he Actually, in person, he's very mesmerizing. We learn something yep. from him every time. Uh, so he puts on a great show. He, he does. He just knows <laughs> a lot. Um, but we're glad to have him on today, and uh, glad to check in with him. It's been a while since we've had him on the show. I mean, probably over a year, well, so lots happened. Things have changed a little yeah, bit in yeah. that whole industry, what we for, used to right. see him at. So. For, for him and for us. That's true. Right. So, so it's, bring it's him good. on, Drew. Let's do it. Who do we have? We have Dan Crawl. How are you, sir? Dan Crawl. Good, good, man. It's good National to see you guys. Ambassador to Glenn Morangy. Yes, that's me. Um, <laughs> and, you know, as you'd mentioned in the uh, in the intro, um, yeah, stuff has changed a lot. And we're all uh, you guys were used to staring into a camera all the time already. And kudos to you. And you did a lot of live stuff to him. Or one of the first things that uh, I remember uh, doing with you guys was a, a, a live streamed interview uh, during the Biden Table Show uh, in Indy. Uh, and I was like, man, these guys. These guys are cutting edge. They're, they, you know, it was just like, it's, they're they're feeling it. They're 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 going to the hoop with this whole concept, and you know, and, and what you've built since then, which has been I don't know four or five years now, um, is really impressive. And and you 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 foreshadowed uh, the changes in the industry by a number of years. You I mean you couldn't have known uh, unless you, you're as, even more prescient than I thought you were um, that we'd be here now. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way that you've done what you've done dovetails beautifully with what is otherwise a, a fairly horrifying set of realities that brought us here. But you've <laughs> you've made uh, you've you've made that transition for not just me, but for the thousands and thousands of uh, uh, subscribers that you have. You've made that transition less about being alienated and separated from people, and more about interconnection, even though it is in two dimensions. So. Obviously, kudos to you guys. Uh, it's a huge part of the industry now, and, and we all, within the confines of Scotch whiskey or whiskey otherwise, owe you a debt of gratitude for the for the <laughs> immense amount of work that you've well, built. Well, so we're far. glad we could help. It was yeah, a lot of work for I us. Mean, so, you know, <laughs> drinking Scotch is a hard job. <laughs> it's difficult. It's difficult stuff. Uh, it's, it's very taxing. And, 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 and as you as you guys know, and I've over the last year found out, um, th doing this stuff. Is a ton of work. There's a there's a lot of production issues. There's a there's a lot of uh, video editing stuff. There's a lot of technology that you've got to get uh, somewhat familiar with, uh, and and so it, the part that goes on screen, the part that people see, uh, is hanging out and drinking, and that's great, and that's what it ought to be. And the fellowship involved with that, and the and the communications aspect of uh, the the communication loop that's closed when someone grabs a uh, glass of scotch whiskey and drinks it. Those things, you know, you you've brought all that stuff to life, but it, it there's a lot under the you know you're kicking ass under the surface, but it looks like you're just <laughs> swanning around. It's beautifully done. Yeah. Uh, are you making the adjustment uh, in the last year in your job? I mean, honestly, you're a people yeah. in your face type of guy. What you've been and you've had to scale back and do this now, and how's that affecting you? It's been uh, it's been a real um, transition. Um, because it, it's it's like watching uh, uh, Stephen Colbert or something where you're used to having a live interaction with other people in three dimensions and then you've got to go and you've got to sit and talk to a camera and try to be, uh, in his case, funny 
uh, in my case, whatever the hell it is that I do, um, uh, <laughs> informative or or whatever they pay me to do. Um, and so there's, and it's particularly weird, like, and I'm sure you guys deal with this. You probably deal with this all the time. I mean, I know you, you have your crawl of people that are responding to you in real time and that's, and that's fantastic. Um, and if you're doing a webinar for a bunch of people and you, it's, it is honestly like talking to yourself in a room and hoping that it's working on the other side. Cause you have no earthly idea how it's being responded to in the, in the dozens or whatever of homes around the country that you're speaking into at that point. Uh, so you just sort of cross your fingers and go for it, you know. And, and I was having a conversation the other day uh, with uh, with somebody who's involved with uh, Drammers Club Omaha here, and uh, and it came up in conversation that it, you rely so heavily on your passion for a thing at that point that it's what has to carry. And right. If, you, if it's yeah. out there, there's no way to have it be carried anywhere other than into the ditch. It's very yeah. true. Very true. I, I think that I've found. I mean, especially when we do our Zoom calls, so it's a little more intimate with our patrons. Right. If, if we're discussing a bottle that we're having and they're having, a lot of the time it's like, you know, if they're not in the room with you, the, the yep. smells that you have in the room with you versus where they're at or what they ate that day, like all of those things play into it. And, and there's a lot more nuanced approach to it that I never really realized, even with us doing this for mm -hmm. almost six years now. That yeah. You know, having a, an in-person, well, Mark and I did a, a whiskey tasting, what, two weeks ago? A couple of weeks ago, yeah. And uh, it, it was nice to kind of get back in the saddle and actually talk to people face-to-face -face and have an interaction with people. That was That's, fun. I'm looking forward to that bit where uh, as I've had very, very uh, um, tiny little experiences in the last year where the people are in three dimensions. You know, they're actually there and you almost want to go hug every one of them. Uh, with you know the appropriate mask um, and so on and so forth, but you don't obviously. Uh, by the time we get back to doing things like like you know whiskey fest or whatever it is that we're going to be doing, because that whole thing is a state of flux as well. Um, it'll be uh, it'll it'll be really joyous, I think, uh, yeah. to see other enthusiasts actually in the flesh in three dimensions and and be able to interact with them again in a way that I took for granted. Yeah. For years and years and years, because that's what it was. That's how you did your job. And then it's, you know, one day you get off a plane and you don't get back on it for a long time. Uh, I can so imagine you'd be re-energized at your job again. It's almost like taking a break. You're still doing it. But when you see it live again, you're like, oh, my gosh, I really enjoyed this and miss this. Yeah. So, yeah. There's that number of years where you build that skill set. And then you have to then not only do you not get to exercise that skill set that you have, you have to build a whole batch of skills that you don't have. So there's not a lot of opportunity to not feel like you're absolutely floundering uh, uh, trying to learn an entirely new way of doing a job. Do you, I mean, there, there are some whiskey events that are coming back this year, I guess. Yes. Yeah. I, it is, has your company, it seems like it's company by company, whether they want to send people, like how they're interacting with that stuff. Yeah. Are, are you finding that you're going to be going back out or are they kind of taking a wait and see approach? It, nothing's been committed to yet. The farther the farther into the year the event in question is, the higher the likelihood that we'll be involved. Um, uh, but we're it's it's only wait and see to a point because we've got to. There are plans being built and and seminars that need to be, you know, applied for and and pitched and paid for and all the things that come along with and those happen months and months and months in advance. So sure. we're dancing on a bit of a knife's edge here in terms of. I mean, there's a there's a whole new surge that's happening right now, so the, it puts things in a, in a state of uh, uh, an extended state of uh, nobody knows what's going on. Uh, but we're certainly leaning we're leaning towards the uh, the October and beyond um, uh, festivals and such, and the September ones. Uh, I would certainly love to be involved with because some really cool ones. Interesting. Uh, and and earlier than that, anything mm -hmm. that's happening in August, you know, it'd be great to be involved, but. Uh, those decisions are happening uh, several rungs above my pay grade. Uh, so I'll go where I'm told when I'm told to go there. <laughs> right. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would imagine that regardless of how things open up, this is going to be somewhat a new state of, of, of business for you and everyone else that used right. to do it. Because, I mean, just like in, in the tech world, I mean, you know, having offices and stuff, there are going to be some, but the virtual piece of it and working and doing this, it's another, another job aspect to it. It's going yeah. to evolve and get... I mean, let's look at the tools we have now that we didn't have 
a year ago to make what we're doing right now even easier. So right. I think just how you guys adapt and how the whiskey community adapts is going to be interesting in, in 2022. I think it, I think it will. By the time we get to 2022, we'll see how how many of our learned behaviors and and you know uh, uh, preferences in terms of the kinds of things we'll keep, the kinds of things that we'll discard. Uh, we, you know, we we'll go back to a bit of a hybrid between between what we used to do and what we do now. Uh, and I think that'll be a good balance because yeah. we've learned some things. I certainly on our team, and I know you guys were already really well versed in this. Uh, it's a powerful medium, you know. There, it's uh, you, you, I didn't have to. Uh, you know, over the course of a certain week, I can be uh, I can be activating coast to coast from my basement, uh, and that wasn't true before by any means. It would have, you know, if you factor in the time and the expense and the carbon footprint and all the things that go along with constant travel, um, having some of that back because <clears throat> there is a there's a kineticism and, a, and an energy Absolutely. about live stuff, but there's also the, an undeniable efficiency and effectiveness of this kind of. Of this sure. way of working as well, so I think we'll see both. Absolutely. Yeah, we got to get in topic. What you got there for us, Mark? So to oh, lead yeah. into the topic, uh, you know, you're. I, I was really excited that you were able to come on today for this topic because uh, you know a lot about it. Your company, uh, Glenn Morangy, specifically is very heavily involved in the sourcing of wood that you guys use. Mm -hmm. We picked up this bottle. You've got it highlighted right there. It's the uh, right. Lava, and we were just and we haven't uh -huh. reviewed this yet. But um, we thought, you know, this would be an interesting lead into the topic because we're really going to try to get into the nuts and bolts of wood um, from every aspect. So let's start off with just talking about this for a hot second, and then we can really dive into the uh, the, the geekiness of wood in the, the whiskey industry. Yeah, um, this happened, uh, these barrel select releases, uh, this is the first of them. Uh, are going are uh, a little bit of a, a branching out for us. They're uh, they're relatively smaller runs. Uh, they're North America only, uh, predominantly U.S. only. They tend to go through Total Wine and Spirits, although that's not exclusively the case. Uh, but they they did they did get the lion's share of them, depending on the market that you're in. Uh, and this represents because we uh, the private editions ended uh, with Alta. Um, it gives Bill, uh, Dr. Bill, our master distiller, uh, other avenues uh, to access uh, his c questioning of the what if, uh, which is pr pretty much his role all the time. What if we did this? What if we did this? Has this ever been done before? We ought to try this. Uh, and Malaga cask, uh, it, it's not the first time Glenmorange has experimented with Malaga cask, but it's been a long time. <clears throat> and uh, and you see that the proof on this is slightly higher, 47.3. Uh, yeah. Gives us an opportunity to stretch out a little bit. Like you see this one in the background, um, uh, Cadball 15, Cadball Batch 1. Uh, that's another uh, single batch release, uh, but it's a 43 ABV liquid. It's a little bit more in line with the with the palate impact and the, and the flavor characteristics of the core range of Glamorangy. And then with these, and you'll see you'll see them moving forward. I can't really tell you uh, anything about wow. specifics, but you'll see some barrel selects in, in the future as well. Um, and they are they're an opportunity for Bill to stretch his legs in ways that only go to a certain part of the world, so the output doesn't have to be huge. The number of casts that he lays down doesn't have to be massive. Uh, and there's it's there's very little risk these days. I was talking to Bill about the same topic about a year ago. Well, over a year ago. Um, and he had said, look, I've been doing this long enough that my, yes, I, my question was, geez, do you, how often do you, uh, do you not strike out, but how often do you go down swinging with one of these things where you put, you lay something down, it's somewhat experimental, you come back four, five, six, seven, ten 10 years later, and it's just not happening. And he said, you know, it's, that's the, the, the benefit of being in the industry for such a long time. My batting average is very good. Uh, yeah. and so with these uh, we can we can stay a little more nimble, a little more light on our feet, uh, hit the market with some really compelling stuff. And I think it helps people to see that Glamorgie really is, even though it's a pretty big company, number four single ball in the world, it's still a company that's interested in pushing the envelope uh, as hard as we can all the time without losing a sense of who we are in that process. Well, without uh, giving a review, uh, it's quite tasty. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Uh, I, I would I'd be interested uh, to watch a review of this by you guys because you do. I really like your processes. Uh, you vet things, you know, uh, thoroughly. Uh, and when you come up with uh, when you come up with a review, it's it's obviously thoroughly thought out 
and really well presented. So, you know, uh, we're looking forward to uh, your opinions on this one. But yeah, uh, Malaga, if you sort of drew a line of latitude uh, uh, east from Jerez de la Frontera in Spain, uh, the sort of the, the guts of the Sherry Triangle, you'd end up in uh, the Malaga uh, district, the town called Malaga as well. Uh, and it's Sherry-like, certainly conceptually, it's, it's not a ton different. But in Malaga, they focus on uh, uh, PX and Muscatel uh, nearly exclusively. So the, the 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 great variety makeup is is a bit different. But the theory, the concept of it, the practice of it, isn't massively different than what you'd find uh, in uh, the Sherry Triangle in Spain. So you know, conceptually, you can kind of count on possibly because of Muscatel and PX. If you think about what you might uh, end up with with an uh, Oloroso uh, finished or influenced whiskey, this is going to skew just a bit sweeter, maybe a little bit more yeah. dried fruit. I, I was going to say it's it's almost a, a dessert wine finish, yeah. um, and it's it's very nice, but it's got a, a sweetness about it. Not not cloyingly sweet, but it's it's there. The um, one thing that you said before we started the show, which I wanted to make sure we talk, since we're going to talk about this for a hot second, and, and sure. Bring it up. Sean, Sean uh, made a really astute observation quickly, and so I'm curious. All of the all of the Glen Morangy lineup starts with the 10. It's the right. 10, and then it's finished for two years or, or longer right. now. Uh, but this one was only eight years. Is that correct? And then he, four years. Right. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's true. I'm glad somebody said it because I haven't been cleared to say that. But yes. Uh, it was a, <laughs> I think, I think about, well, I was yeah. just because you know all the other times we've done the whole lineup, it's it's very you know everything starts with the ten. That's the base yes. spirit, uh, yep. unless you've got the signet. Um, so this is, I mean, obviously I get the base spirit in there, but it's it's got more of a finishing flavor Heavier to it. Finish right, um, which yeah. is interesting. Yep, yeah, yeah. Uh, a bit more of a. Um, the influence of the signature, the Malaga's signature is is more indelibly linked to the overall flavor profile of the whiskey without it being something that becomes over oaked. I think that was the theory to begin wow. with was that Malaga cask was going to be a pretty influential cask. And if we came to it with a full 10 years in ex-bourbon oak, we might end up with something that was a little too woody, a little too influenced by the barrel and, and you run the risk of losing the essence of the of the new make the 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 whiskey not the whiskiness but the but the DNA of the distillery itself uh, once once something falls okay. over the balance line okay. into the wood you do sort of lose the essence of what the distillery brought to the table and I think that's what you're looking at in terms of eight and four you don't hear DNA and and whiskey no. talk too much <laughs> <But> so, <laughs> interestingly enough the way you talked about being over you know too long in the bourbon is the exact opposite of what I was thinking, but it brings in the whole topic of wood. And, it's and important. So, yeah. well, how important is this to our whiskey, right? So the vast majority of scotch starts in an ex-bourbon ex cast. Not all of it, right? But I mean, what are the types that we can, what that the whiskey industry can use? We've got oak, obviously, and there's various types of oak, Japanese, yeah. European, Spanish. Or, um, yeah. Um, uh, the Scotch whiskey is is held to an oak standard only. Um, it, 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 in terms of used oak, the, the cask cannot be another type of wood. Uh, so you wouldn't be able to use uh, rock maple or African babinga or whatever it is that you're into. Um, you'd have to use oak. Now, secondarily, that oak, the provenance of that oak is somewhat important. It doesn't have to be seasoned. But if it is seasoned, i.e. used before, then what was in it before becomes uh, somewhat of a question. There's a, there's a committee that decides whether or not that you can use a given cask, even if it's oak, uh, if you're planning to use something that is that has seen the influence of a previous wine spirit or other liquid. So the, the benchmark for that is if you want to use a cask that held a previous occupant, whatever that is, then that previous occupant would historically have to be something that is matured in oak. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't you can't go using that's why that's why the the, the gin thing. You're not really going to see a lot of gin casts floating around in terms of gin finish because uh, gin. Even though that yes, there are some uh, wood matured gins, it isn't the it isn't the the core identity for that spirit category. Sure. So you that's that's out. The committee would say no, you can't use that. 
Uh, now, uh, a liquid that it, this is where things get a little bit dicey in terms of the committee still got a the committee is like a small version of the SWA, the, the Scotch Whiskey Association, and it's their responsibility to make sure that the distillers, the the innovators in the industry, are, are kept in somewhat of a check so that the 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 traditions that are identifiably Scotch whiskey aren't too aggressively deviated from. Uh, so there, you know, if somebody comes and says, I want to use this, this super wacky uh, uh, mezcal cask, they're going to have to look pretty closely in terms of, okay, tell us about the, tell us about the provenance of that, of, of mezcal in general and, and the percentage of which that sees oak and so on and so forth. And they're going to break that down and say yes or no. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and to a degree and Bill's on, uh, Dr. Bill's on the committee. Um, so he's going to use his expertise and, and sort of think through that process and go, man, is this likely to, pr to produce a horrendous result? I'm going to be a little more nervous right. about approving this if the result is very likely to be uh, uh, horrifying uh, on the palate. So, so, so it almost saves experimental uh, people from themselves a little bit. <laughs> you, well, yeah, because because no matter what happens, there's so many there, there's so many expressions that are coming out. I mean, a Scottish whiskey's got to be as competitive as everybody else. So, uh, and and that is a, that's a battle on the shelf. You, you're you're even though you're you're making this this legacy liquid that's representative of of an entire culture and people and history and their struggles and uh, their triumphs and all those things, you're still in order to uh, have contact with the end user, you got to be on the shelf, and so the shelf becomes a, a real battleground. And, and there's elbows getting thrown on that shelf all the time. Uh, so as the as the number of SKUs uh, expands in the Scotch whiskey industry, uh, and the and the the shelf space, maybe it's a six foot, eight foot, sixteen, whatever it is in terms of the shelf space, uh, the the whiskey makers that are innovating are going to take up more of the facings on that shelf. Uh, than the ones that aren't, uh, and the ones that aren't tend to uh, begin to lose their 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 footprint on the retail shelf, and therefore the representation in uh, in in the home. So, mm -hmm. th so then there's this there's this heavy uh, impetus to um, to innovate, uh, to experiment and innovate and push the envelope, and and the you know the committee that decides what kind of cast you can use and the SWA are there to make sure that we don't lose ourselves in a, in a frenzy of innovation. We don't lose the traditions that make Scotch whiskey, Scotch whiskey. You can look at, and I'm not throwing stones at it by, by any means, but I think tequila is currently suffering from uh, a, 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 a slightly looser interpretation of its historical duty uh, to maintain itself as a as a, uh, a legacy liquid, and that goes back to you know uh, distilleries using di diffusers and all the things that are happening now to speed the, the process up and 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 reduce costs. And we'll see where that plays out. But I think the SWA plays the role of hang on, let's just you guys are pulling right. this way, we're pulling this way. Something magic will happen in the middle as long as we don't, as long as the tug of war stays as essentially a draw. Which right, makes sense. Makes sense. So I guess uh, since we're talking about wood, how, what's, what's the, it, you guys own actually logging rights, correct? In Missouri and other yeah. places. How we, do you guys go about determining where you even want the, the rights to source your wood from? Well, what ends up happening is we're looking for ideal environment for slow growth um, oak. And slow growth oak requires certain things to be true. And this, so this is, uh, we're looking specifically uh, at, the, at the Mark Twain forest in the Ozarks. And we're looking at a single cooperage, uh, the Brown Forma cooperage, that helps us to realize this vision that we developed, uh, that Bill uh, developed over a long period of time in, in concert with those guys, because he knew that they were the ones that could bring it to life. So the idea of this, this sort of ideal oak uh, is, is going to at least for our uh, for our main maturation medium, the ideal uh, oak is is going to be Quercus alba. It's going to be um, uh, uh, white oak. Uh, it's going to be uh, ideally uh, north facing, uh, growing up in the shadow of other trees, uh, so that the leaf canopy is essentially on the top, and there aren't a lot of branches, and it doesn't have uh, direct access to sunlight. It's sort of filtered access to sunlight so that it doesn't bother creating a lot of branches on its sides. It's looking for sunlight coming from the top 
So it grows slow and it doesn't develop a lot of branches, which means it doesn't develop a lot of uh, knot holes, which means it doesn't leak. So you've got uh, you've got an ideal uh, number of rings per inch in terms of the rate of growth, and that's 12 to 16 rings uh, per inch. You're looking for 100 to 125 year old uh, oak. So that's uh, that's essentially uh, 100 to 125 year old white oak, uh, north facing, growing up in the slow growth, growing up in the shadow of other trees, uh, and that's that part of the Mark Twain forest. There are, so yeah, that's all. That's all. No big deal. And then once that once that tree is identified and felled and, and brown foreman knows that that's what we're looking for, those casts are painfully expensive. Uh, even though they're, they are destined for inclusion in the bourbon, or bourbon industry, we own them first and we own them throughout. And they're a good four times as much uh, to produce as a typical ex bourbon oak cask would be. Part of that is the, is the, the persnicketiness with which we uh, 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 approach tree choice. But the other part is that it's all got to be at least two, ideally three years of air seasoning, mm. and that because if you if you either kiln dry, which is which hardly ever happens in the bourbon industry, to be fair, uh, most most of the wood that goes into uh, American uh, uh, bourbon oak cooperage is going to be air dried because you've got a real problem when you kiln dry young oak because instead of allowing the rains over several years to leach out those those resinous or acrid elements of wood you laminate them in in a kiln so then when you expose sure. it when you expose that that pyrolyzed that heated wood uh double heated wood because you're going to toast and then char when you go to cooper uh when you expose that to uh the the, the alcohol water uh, solution that you put into it uh in order to make whiskey those elements of that oak that are soluble in water or soluble in alcohol if some of those acrid or resinous elements are trapped in the wood, they're also soluble in either alcohol or water or a combination of each, and they'll end up in your whiskey. So air seasoning is absolutely critical. And we're, we, we wouldn't touch a cast that wasn't air seasoned with a 50-foot pole. But for our specific, what we'd call designer cast, we're looking for uh, at least two, uh, ideally three years of, of uh, air seasoning in the outdoors where they're, they're cut, it's, uh, it's quarter sawn cut into essentially blanks and then racked outside. And it sits there and you can kind of see over the course of years, you can see this kind of resiny stuff that's just run off uh, via the rains. <laughs> and you, that's what you want to get rid of because that's really going to make for a funky whiskey. And there's some bacterial breakdown. Uh, the wood begins to break down a little bit and allows it, it, itself to be accessed with a little bit more um, uh, regularity once, the, once that alcohol, water, and impurities or congener solution goes in uh, for the primary maturation of what it, for, for our designer cast is, is Jack Daniels or that distillery in Tennessee that makes most of the whiskey. But if, if you guys weren't going to that length with this specific, specific stand of wood, what's the normal process? Where does a, any other distillery get their bourbon, their, are their casks from? I mean, the vast majority are from the bourbon industry. First, yep. people want to know why, um, which mm -hmm. we know the answer, but I mean, this is a good conversation to answer it. And then secondly, you know, are they at the mercy of the bourbon distillery that chose the wood then? I mean, do you got, what's the process there? Do you, are they inspecting them, going to different distilleries and saying, yeah, we're going to stay away from these guys. They're using crap, you know, casts or how's that go? In Scotland, you will find that the industry leans very heavily on an organization called Speyside Cooperage. Uh, and Speyside Cooperage has a number of locations uh, throughout Scotland. But the big one, the big one is in Speyside. No surprise there. Uh, and if you were able to, <laughs> if you saw it, it would, and uh, there are, there are some in, images on the internet. If you get a chance to uh, Google search uh, Space Side Cooperage, it is an immense row of immense piles of, of used uh, oak, uh, whether it's coming from Spain or Portugal or France or the U.S. or, you know, Canada, wherever it's coming from. Uh, Space Side Cooperage is the clearinghouse that, that brings all of those casts wow. in. That handles all the shipping and then parts them out based on what the distilleries are asking them for. Uh, so it, as long as you're you're talking about um, you know uniformly seasoned oak, we we have in terms of the cast that we use for our sherry influenced whiskeys like Lasanta 18 year Signet. There's some sherry influenced Signet. Um, we're using uh, a particular fella in Spain uh, by the name of Miguel Martin uh, to create. And, uh, and and make sure that those casts 
uh, are producing the sorts of flavors that we want from them. He's a, his, his family uh, owns a sherry bodega <clears throat> and he's a, he's a sherry producer, but he also, uh, the, the, the family has found tremendous success uh, producing uh, consistent quality ex sherry oak for the whiskey industry in Scotland. So, so yeah, so are, are most of those casks then either either Speyside's Cooper or, or what uh, Glamorange uses, are they broken down and then shipped to Scotland or they're shipped as whole casks? Everything stays together. Super good question. Um, back uh, as the industry has grown and developed and as, and you know, there are pluses and minuses with, with everything. Um, but as shipping costs have dropped and, and to a degree uh, we've got to, particularly here in the U S we've got to, we've got to own some of that as being an affectation of, of expanded fracking to be fair. Uh, uh, and you know, you take that and you sort of cope with it uh, emotionally in, in whatever way you need to. But um, that that has lowered shipping costs to the point that it, may, it no longer makes sense to ship palletized casks to Scotland to pay Coopers to put them back together. Okay. Uh, so you ship whole casks from here because your shipping costs are lower than they used to be uh, in order to have them show up on the other side ready to fill as opposed to having to hire a whole bunch of Coopers in Scotland to put them back together. Well, that, may, that makes sense, but do they ever make any kind of adjustments to them or kind of their yes. own special? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thought, at, uh, at, Speyside, at Speyside Coopers, they've got a massive number of Coopers that are doing the repair work and the selection work and the and you know creating creating uh, hogsheads and, stuff and things like that. And hogsheads are really just uh, franken barrels uh, to a degree. You'd, you'd, you'd take you'd take staves uh, mm -hmm. from, let's say, barrel comes in, it's got some issues, you've got to replace a stave. Barrel comes in and it's got a whole bunch of issues. You just got to break that barrel apart. You take the staves that, that are good and are yeah. working and you, you put them in a different place. Then you create uh, hogsheads out of them that are shorter and squatter. Sure. So you cut the, you'd cut the, right. the top and the bottom off. And that is the reason that uh, hogsheads are so much rarer than they used to be is because so many casts come from the America, come from America um, uh, still whole. Uh, back when uh, palletized casts from the U.S. would come to Scotland, there were a lot more hoggies around because uh, a barrel is a handmade thing. And so, you know, putting it back together, it's not quite going to work the, as well as it did when it was first manufactured. Oh, yeah. So then sense. you then you hogshead it. Then you, you cut the tops and bottoms of the staves off and you reassemble it the way you want. It becomes instead of a, 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 a an ASB or 200 liter vessel, it becomes a 250. It's just a little bit, if, if, that's a, if that is a bourbon hogshead, to be fair. Hmm. All right. And yeah, there's a question. For, uh, that's a that's a super good question. Yeah, essentially, um, we're uh, we're using the same brokers uh, and using the same sources uh, for the cast that go to both Glamorgie and Ardbeg, to, al almost exclusively. There's going to be uh, some some variations here and there if if they want to do something experimental at, uh, at Ardbeg that clearly wouldn't be a good idea at uh, Glamorgie, then. Then that would be a single strain, like um, uh, what the hell was it? Uh, Kelpie. Uh, that sure. that the, the the barrel sourcing for Kelpie was specific to Ardbeg, and that none of those would have shown up at Glamorangy, so far as I know. And Bill's always got something up his sleeve, so that's as far as we've ever communicated. Yeah. We we do um, like but, surprises, so that's that's fine <laughs> if he's got some, some things it may, away. Yeah, it, there may. There, I know that there are there are dozens and dozens of experimental whiskeys uh, laying down uh, right now uh, at Glamorangy that, that won't see the light of day for years and we won't begin to discuss them for many, many moons. But uh, uh, you guys know Glenmo and, and Ardbeg and Bill well enough to know that uh, he's got his hands in a lot of a lot of pies. So Well, yeah, so along those lines, you're, you're talking about different types of woods and yep. scotch has to be oak, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. But yeah. What about other woods? Why? I mean, is there a reason for oak, or can other woods like chestnut or maple or peach wood or what other things? You want to use? Why, why wouldn't you use other types of wood? Right. Um, uh, that comes back to an SWA ruling, uh, and and to a degree, okay. it was it's it's Bill's fault um, because the, <laughs> the old the old rules used to be wood, uh, and then Bill started doing some funky stuff, and the SWA got a hold of it. Uh, of the idea of, and they're like, hang on, we need to regulate this a little bit more aggressively. Let's let's make it oak because we feel like oak is 
critical to maintaining the historical flavor characteristics that are identifiable as Scotch whiskey. And uh, Bill tells the story uh, about uh, coopering some Brazilian cherry wood. Um, this is before the rule changed. Mm -hmm. And Lang uh, actually it wasn't, it was, it was during the rule change. It was them that when they heard about what he was doing with Brazilian cherry wood, that's sort of what, what the catalyst for the rule change was. Uh, but by the time that whiskey was, uh, quote unquote, mature, uh, you know, Bill knew all along, okay, when the rule changed, and I've still got this stuff laying down in cherry wood, um, I can't call it scotch anymore, what do I do? And he was somewhat relieved to find out that it was awful. Uh, it was it was really <laughs> like un, undrinkably bad. So he was somewhat relieved, but if it had been good, he would have found a way to release it, just calling it something right. else. But yeah, so the idea is not that it's not that oak is the be all end all. Um, it is, it's, you know, it can be coopered watertight, which helps a lot. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's, um, uh, the, you know, our, our supply chains are very consistent around the world. Uh, the, the experience, uh, you know, the global experience in coopering uh, uh, funky woods is, is less so. So you invite a little bit more quality control issues and, and consistency issues in uh, when you allow for that. But by the same token, you know, I got a, a bottle of uh, Distillery 291 stuff here from Colorado Springs, and they dropped a charred uh, aspen branch into it at the end uh, for like the last six weeks or something. I'm like, and that's interesting. They even sent me a chunk of the aspen. Uh, it, that kind of stuff would be super fun. And I think that globally, there's a <laughs> lot of experimentation happening there. And, you know, we obviously welcome that, but to a degree, our hands are tied by right. the oak thing and it's it's like having your hands tied by it with super plush velvet you know it's just not that big deal <laughs> that seems to be so, kind of the thing though right your your hands are tied over when you make scotch like over here for example just the yeah. sky's the limit well see and that's that's the thing that i think we should contrast here is all, yeah. all whiskeys aren't bound by that rule only scotch whiskey i think is the only one bound by oak at this well, point Bourbon. Straight, straight bourbons and straight rice uh, okay. would be yeah. 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 Like American whiskeys, even I think Japanese whiskey. The new rules you can have any wood is allowed. It doesn't need to be oak. So and Canadians are allowed as as well. And Irish. But with these rules, yeah. so okay, there's how many different types of oak, and I know that the different types Lots. of oak are different. They they had they pr put influence the profile of the whiskey differently. So is it legal? I know I can start uh, maturing my, my scotch in American oak for 10 years. It's like the yep. Glenmo 10, right? Um, and then I can turn around and I can put it in a European oak for two more. Mm -hmm. But back in the day of palletizing casks, would it be legal or commonplace to take staves of European oak and American oak and put them together? Is that into one class? It it wouldn't have been real common in Scotland. It's a it's a compelling uh, conversation, and the guys that you know, guys at Maker's Mark certainly um, are uh, notorious for monkeying around with with uh, <laughs> seared seared staves and and yeah. dropping French oak into American oak uh, uh, casts and things like that. And that results have been beautiful. Uh, you know that's uh, uh, what's going on with uh, you know Warehouse X and all of the all of the experimental stuff that uh, the guys at Buffalo Trace are up to. Uh, certainly, there's a lot to be said for that the the direction that that's headed. But historically, back in the palletized days, now nah, you'd uh, because you've got uh, uh, different uh, stave widths as well, uh, oh, different yeah. thicknesses and widths, and so you've got a lot of a lot of weirdness. And and they uh, because there are different densities, they would swell in different ways, and it would be really difficult to make a watertight cask out of uh, uh, out of quote unquote integrated oak staves. All right. Yeah, because that, that would be a good way to skirt the rules there, or yeah. you could get American, yeah. you could get American, European, and Japanese oak all in the same barrel. Right. It's an oak barrel, if, you know, and so it meets the rules. But if, if the physics of that doesn't work, then, then you're out of luck. And yeah. The, yeah. The, the barrel falls even apart. With, <clears throat> right. Even with Mizanara, um, which is a fascinating wood, super expensive. It takes a long time for those trees to mature. Even when they're well, they're they're well cut and well coopered, it's really difficult to make a watertight Mizanara cast. So that oh, really? stave, th that number of staves, uh, could get not wiggly and weird uh, in ways that are that are not only unpredictable but relatively expensive. If, if you're you've got if you're inviting uh, incremental leakage uh, yeah. in the warehousing. Right. Yeah, nobody nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. <laughs> no, no, and and oxidization, the rate of oxidization of the of the interior contents is going to shift a bit because you've got different. It's going to be less predictable. Uh, 
your your evaporative loss that's sure that's an that's a that's an expense and as long as you're using a, a consistent species of oak uh, throughout that cooperage you probably have a fairly consistent uh, loss rate uh, Scotland is relatively regulated in terms of its uh, summer and winter highs and lows across the country uh, but you yeah you would you would have it, the inconsistency it's the oxidization inside the cask is incredibly important uh, not the evaporative loss itself so much but what is allowed for as the as the liquid volume uh, drops and the and the volume of air that's drawn into the cask in the in the void where liquid used to be uh, the 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 scale at which reactive oxidization and maturation based esterification are happening inside of that cask it's more predictable the more you, more consistently you're using uh, wow. you know those species wow. together so it's basically a, a a quality control kind of thing using the same types of wood every time because you understand the results at scale uh, based oh, off of yeah. of prior experience mm -hmm. certainly and and the franken cask idea i think is it would be really fascinating to 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 experiment and and drink the results and figure out what's going on there uh but it would take <clears throat> it would take a uh a, a stomach for the vastly experimental uh yeah. and the budget to pull it off and that's you know that's a lot of what happened well like when uh and you guys are aware of this um glamorgy has built an experimental distillery that's stuck to the back of glamorgy uh, and so, you know, one of the things I can absolutely guarantee is that every aspect of the whiskey making process will be subjected to experimentation there because we can. It's got its own dedicated fermentation feed. Uh, it, it will have its own, if, if it wants it, uh, dedicated warehousing uh, and, and a, a vastly configurable uh, distillation regimen as well. Uh, so you 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 know your your points about uh, integrating different uh, stave types and so on and so forth. If it can be thought of, it will be experimented with. Then, for sure. <laughs> I like that kind of place. I do too. Well, here's yeah. here. You're a new scientist. <laughs> yeah. Talked about in, in, the, in the whole wood thing now, but and, and it's for the sake of the conversation for those folks that are really wanting it to, to learn about wood. Um, tell us a little bit about the process, whether it's charring, recharring. What's yep. a wet cask toasted. mean? Toasted. You know, there you see all these words on labels, and you're like, "Oh, well, this is recharred, toasted, and scraped." You know, you know, what's that mean to that right. bottle of whiskey? Yeah, it's going to have a tremendous impact. You know, and, and you guys have heard, uh, I'm sure, a billion times the estimates in terms of sixty percent, sixty-five percent, seventy percent, whatever it is of the inherent flavor profile of a given whiskey coming out of Scotland is going to be uh, uh, derived from barrel influence. And so it becomes massively important to make decisions based on understanding that that medium is is, is right. such a huge influencer in terms of uh, in terms of flavor. So as you look at uh, Ocast, and part of the reason that we deal with uh, Brown Former Cooperage and with Jack Daniels, yes, there used to be a, an import relationship between Glamorangy and Brown Forman. Uh, and that existed up until the time that uh, uh, Glamorangy and Arbic were bought by LVMH. Uh, but the cooperage re uh, um, relationship and the relationship between the distilleries didn't go away. The reason for that is Brown Former Cooperage is very good at what they do. And secondarily, if you're getting casts from Jack Daniels, you know you know for sure that they were used exactly four years to the day. So when we get those back, particularly the ones that we owned before they used them, uh, we're getting a very, very uniform uh, medium with which to mature our cask. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean though that a cask is a cask is a cask, particularly in uh, uh, the, the fellow behind that uh, that whole SCR process and the shave toast rechar process. Uh, uh, he's passed away, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Jim Swan, uh, the industry's leading wood expert uh, during the course of his lifetime. We wow. certainly consulted with Jim on a number of projects, uh, including, uh, oh golly, uh, Milshin was a huge one that we that we um, consulted with. We I, I had nothing to do with it, but uh, but Jim Swan and, and uh, yeah. Dr. Bill, very close friends. It was a, a, a fairly devastating loss to the industry uh, uh, when Jim died. Uh, but there are distilleries, you know, the length and breadth of Scotland who will quote uh, Jim Swan as being a huge part of their understanding of the of oak as a maturation medium, the thorough understanding of it beyond just hey, there's a bourbon barrel, let's fill it. Uh, so if you look at those different things, let's say you're getting ex bourbon oak in from the U.S., it's it's 
and you're in Scotland, the odds of it being a number three or number four char, i.e., and I think it breaks down to every 30 seconds of it being on fire as a new degree. So if four, uh, if a four char is two minutes of being on fire, aggressive fire, like uh, like if you've, if you've seen uh, oak charring at, let's say, Independence State uh, in, in Kentucky or in Indiana, uh, Kentucky and Indiana, um, they'll roll that barrel on its side in front of a thing that looks like the, the butt end of the Batmobile. And it just blasts fire through the thing for X number of minutes. And right. that's how you achieve whatever char you're looking for. So mm -hmm. if you back uh, number four down to number three, it's about a minute and a half. Number two is about a minute, so on and so forth. Uh, but that's charring. You can, if, you, if you're talking to your cooperage, you can ask for <clears throat> a toasting regimen and then a charring regimen. Now, if you're making straight bourbon or straight rye, it's got to be charred. Yeah. But you wouldn't char, uh, you wouldn't, you, you know, you wouldn't char sherry cast. Those are toasted. These European oak, the 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 breakdown of, of oak lignans, hemicellulose, cellulose, and 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 heartwood extractives is a different set of ratios. So oh, yeah, charring yeah. may not make much sense there. And and French oak barriques, those aren't going to be charred. They're going to be toasted to different lengths or to different degrees. They're not going to be charred. So American oak's got to be charred if you're going to make straight bourbon or straight rye out of it. So it was to I, more than likely toasted before it was charred. So if you think yeah. about how that works, um, charring a thing, you've got to start it on fire. Physically, it's got to be on fire. Toasting a thing, it's just got to be near an intense heat source. So uh, uh, like um, if you wanted to char an English muffin, you would take a blowtorch and you'd start your English muffin on fire and then it'd be charred. <laughs> but if you want... A toasted English muffin, you put it in the toaster and the, and the intense heat elements are near it, but not touching it. So mm -hmm. that's, that's toasting. And then that can take a good long time. Your toasting could be 30, 45 minutes an hour or longer. Uh, and what wow. you're doing there, the, the difference, the, the, the fundamental structural physical uh, difference between toasting and charring, sure, the intensity wow. and the proximity of the heat source itself. But which of the oak structures is responding to that heat at that time? Uh, so <clears throat> what you're really doing in, in, during charring is taking that the how many cellulose because cellulose is a nice long polymer chain uh, resistant to pyrolytic breakdown. So you've got uh, you've got structural integrity. You can have that cask on fire for a long time and it's going to maintain some structural integrity. The hemicellulose being a shorter polymer chain is gonna react with the heat and break down into about 10 different wood sugars, uh, xylose and so on and so forth that are then caramelized under the heat of the, of the flame. So you end up with, and, that, and those, uh, those caramelized wood sugars uh, are uh, obviously water soluble to a degree alcohol soluble, some of them, but more so water soluble. So you char the hell out of it and you're acting more, activating more hemicellulose there. The aggressive toasting is what's going to get you dug in deeper and deeper and deeper into oh, yeah. the staves right. of the wood from a, from a depth perspective. And yep. oak lignin, the breakdown of oak lignin uh, during the toasting process is really critical to garnering those uh, vanillins and toasting. The, the oak lactone right. is what's being activated during the toasting period. So the longer you toast, the, the longer you toast, by the time that cask gets into the warehouse, the farther the liquid can go in and still find things to combine with. If it's a shallow toast, once it gets past the toast, it's raw wood, basically. So it kind of depends on how long you want your whiskey to sit in the cask, how aggressively you'd want it to be toasted, not to mention how much you'd want to activate, how it just in terms oh, wow. of the quantities of oak lacnone yeah. that you'd want to activate within the staves of the wood. And then the char layer is going to act not only as... Um, Huh. It's going to be up to a degree of flavoring element, a lot of coloring that's going to come because of the uh, uh, because of the caramelized wood sugars, and of course some sweetness going to come out of there. But it's also uh, it's a purification layer because it's yeah, activated it's charcoal, awesome. and yeah. as you, as the the convective process of moving liquid past mm -hmm. uh, via the the internal pressure of the cast builds the uh, the the pores open. This is when it's hot out. The internal pressure inside the cast builds up and the pores open so the, the liquid is forced in deeper and deeper into the staves of the wood. Then when it seizes up, and it seizes up in the winter and the pressure inside the cast drops, then it's pushed back out. So each time it passes through the char layer, it's purified just a little bit more like a massive Brita pitcher. So yeah. that process, <laughs> that convective process. Brita, it is like a Brita pitcher. It's, I mean, it's awesome. huge. The topic is in importance of wood, and we just nerded out. Well, <laughs> yeah. so I, I just see a formula just popped in my head with that toasting depth. depth. Oh, so no. if you're planning yeah. to put up, put Start whiskey, up here. 
into a barrel for 30 years, you probably don't want it very deeply toasted, right? Because it'll overwork. Well, I, I we yeah, this, that's a that's a super good question. I mean, I it's it. I think to a degree, it's going to depend on um, how high the internal pressure of the cask is going to get. Uh, so the hotter the place, you'd probably want to toast a bit more uh, because you you you're more likely to push that liquid farther into the wood, and you wouldn't necessarily want to draw green or or, or oh. uh, um, you know a, a raw wood characteristics raw wood, out of yeah. it. Uh, but uh, the pressure in Scotland, the uh, the pressure inside the cask isn't going to get huge, really, um, uh, because the because the ambient temperature between the the coldness of summer and the hotness of of or you, the other way around. Um, once the once the the, the the bung goes into the bung stave, uh, then you get a fixed, uh, essentially a fixed pressure environment, like one atmosphere. Yeah. And uh, when the environment around that cask gets colder. The pressure is going to drop inside the cask, mm -hmm. and, but the wood's going to seize up too. So then you've got it's like rain out of sponge, and the, yep. the liquid gets forced back in. Uh, but if it's if you're in Kentucky, if you're on a, a, a high floor of a rick house in Kentucky, the pressure inside that cask is going to be immense, oh, like right. really, yeah. really yeah. high. So right. then you you've got a you've got a deeper penetration. But yeah, of course you would run the the risk of extracting more tannic heartwood extractives, certainly. I think that's the risk. That's that's why it's hard to find a twenty year old bourbon that isn't like gnawing on a table leg. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. It, oh yeah, that's true. So, yep. Drew's got some some comment questions from uh, that people have been posting up that we want to kind of get to. So it oh, might be a great. little bit all over the, the topic and conversation. That's, that's great. So, so these are like fast, yeah, fast answer questions. Real quick, so yeah. you want to introduce that one? Yeah. So how do you decide which country's oak to take? Do you experiment with different types of oak, or are you pretty much set with what you got? Um, <clears throat> to a degree, uh, it's going to be based on who's oak coopers well. Uh, if there if there is any if there's any historical uh, uh, cooperage, let's say when we were dealing with um, uh, Caspian Sea oak, to be politically fair about how to describe that, um, the folks that we were dealing with were not super well versed in coopering it. But Bill was really curious about it, so he's like, "Oh well." Let's do it, um, uh, but that's not going to. You're not going to go. You're not going to do a huge run of Caspian Sea Oak because of the unknown nature of what you're getting yourself into. Uh, okay. We tend to uh, Hungarian oak. It, the only reason it's not the only reason, but Taylor Cake exists because Hungarian Royal Tokai exists as a wine. So there's it's it's less risk in terms of. Uh, in Scotland, you're dealing with. You're dealing with the U.S. and Spain almost exclusively, unless it's a Finnish cask. And the Finnish cask, it, the the species of oak, is no more important than the previous occupant uh, of that cask. So the the fact the the fact that a Sauternberry is French oak is a big deal, but we didn't choose it because it's French oak. We chose it because it had Sautern in it. Uh, yeah, and okay. so you you deal with and and, and Portugal is the same way. Uh, and and it, just in case, you know, and, and this is a much longer answer than this person was looking for, but just because a cask isn't charred like French oak barriques doesn't mean that you aren't getting radically different levels of toast in your ex sauterne or your ex French wine mm -hmm. cask that you get into making whiskey from. So each of those casks is going to be is going to develop in a different in a different way, and sometimes a radically different way. And people wonder why we took the age statement on, off a of nectar door. The, the main reason was because it was still gonna be more expensive than the 14 year old Quinta. But the secondary reason in the production, the goals and the production specifics regarding nectar have not changed at all. The challenge in making that whiskey has always been that whatever Sautern breaks you're getting in, that might be a number one toast, that or that might be a 15 minute toast, that might be a oh, 45 wow. minute toast. And so you just don't quite know what you're going to get out of it so in terms of the mature nice whiskey. Yeah. Doing this, you just don't realize it. Yeah. Wow. So no. and, and this is this is kind of this high scale manufacturing, this high volume manufacturing is kind of what what I'm geeking out on here because you've got you've got to have some consistency in what you're producing and you don't want to mess with your formula that much. So you, you get a consistent source, you get a consistent uh, bourbon uh, or Jack Daniels or whatever to, to create that base. And then you can kind of play a little bit on the edges with your finishing and your other thing. But if you're producing thousands or millions of liters of, of liquid a year, then all million liters need to go in a barrel and you don't want to put what well, you don't want it to pour out on the floor through a leaky barrel. So you've got to right. be consistent. Yeah. <laughs> it, right. That's, the, the big challenge there is uh, you can control a lot about whiskey making and you can you there's only but the, your control ends 
where nature decides that it ends. Uh, in the in the fermentation phase, you can control all that environment, but nature decides what's going to happen. In the distillation environment, you got a lot more control, but to a degree, uh, the relationship between copper and distillate and, and uh, all the factors that go into uh, the the uh, the lactic acid bacteria microflora that lives in the pipes and so on and so forth inside of a distillery, nature's going to have an impact on what goes on there, and nature's going to have a massive impact on what goes on in the cask. So, what ends up being your most critical people in the process are the the like for us to be the whiskey creation team, the people that are 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 doing the tasting, the blending. Uh, let's say, you know, it's, it's not a blended whiskey because it's all from the same place, but you, you, not everything we do is a single cask offering. So if you're making original, you are vatting together many, many casks. Each, th each one of those casks is going, nature will have put its indelible thumbprint on each yeah. cask in a different way. So then the tasters, the, the, eva the sensory evaluation people are critical to try to help maintain consistency in an, inher in an inherently inconsistent uh, production environment. Yep. You do what you can, you can, you solve, you solve for the things you can solve for. It's an exercising and accepting what you can control and, sure. and hanging yeah. on uh, for dear life. <laughs> Hang on. I do that every day. Every day. <laughs> a couple quick hitters real quick for you. We're running out of time here. So Gerben asked a question about your, uh, what is it called? It's door door knock. Door knock. Why here. is door knock uh, do so different in cask handling? Uh, door knock distillery. Uh, is that who he's referring to or yeah, door knock in, 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 a, in generally in a place? Uh, well, we'll handle that in, in, in two different ways, in case it's two different questions. Uh, Dornick Distillery, uh, which is doing some really fascinating stuff, some very experimental things, tiny little operation. <clears throat> but Thompson Brothers, uh, those guys are ace. Uh, they've got skills for days. And it's such a small operation. They can do, they can, they are incredibly light on their feet, a meticulous, meticulous people, but they're also uh rampant experimenters they the sort of <laughs> chafe against any any regulation uh that that thwarts their ability to experiment we love those guys I've, I've been to the distillery actually when the distillery was a little tool shed out in back of the dornick castle hotel in in dornick uh they were still doing fascinating stuff and, and hand filling a barrel at a time and doing quarter casts and you could you know people had magic marked where they'd bought a quarter cast awesome. from them as a future and stuff. And, you know, those guys, the, the Dornick hotel bar, uh, uh, Thompson brothers is an independent bottler as well. Uh, bought some really cool stuff from them recently. I, I have tremendous respect for what the, what those guys at Dornick distillery are doing, but it's, it's a tiny operation comparatively. So they're, they're more able to do those kinds of things. Those, those fringier things, uh, Dornick in general, uh, Dornick in general is yeah. I mean, it's 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 a bit of a microcosm. Like uh, Spaceside is is a tale of two Spacesides. Southern Spaceside is old school, and Northern Spaceside is new school. New school being still a hundred and some odd years old. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you've got yeah. you know for every for every Glenn Farkless, there's a, there's a Glenn Limit. You know, I mean, it's it's you can tell where uh, where blenders it gets even. This is way off topic, but uh, you can kind of tell where the blenders, where the Scotch whiskey blenders became uh, an important force in Scotch whiskey production because the, the it was the old school way of making uh, whiskey, heavily sherried, sulfury as hell, meaty, perhaps a bit smoky. And then the blenders who were selling whiskey all over the world in the, in the late 1800s into the, yeah. right before the, before the, uh, the, the crash, before the, um, oh, the, the, the brothers that crashed the industry. I can't remember the name right this minute. Uh, in, the, in the, right around the US depression, uh, the industry collapsed because of a ton of speculation and blends, but the distilleries were being asked basically to sell us a thing that we can blend, that we can sell to Americans and we can sell to other Europeans and so on and so forth. Some distilleries were like, nope, we're doing exactly what we've always done. Screw you. And that would be the Glenn, yeah. the, the, Glenn, the Glenn Farkless model is exactly like the pinnacle of that model. And I love this guy. Uh, but what the, the Glenn Fittix and the Glenn, uh, the uh, Glenn Lewis and Glenn Fittix and all those folks that transferred to ex bourbon and went away from peated barley, they were to a degree and taller stills. We didn't, this may be a revelation, but we didn't put the tall stills in until 1887. Uh, Glamorgia existed since 1943, but 1887, the tall stills went in at least to a degree in response to what the blenders want. Yeah. Wow. So, so we, thank you. We have a few more questions, but we're going to skip them because Mark has some off the topic questions, but if you submitted a question, we didn't answer it. Make yeah, sure yeah. you 
email us at scotchfordummies at gmail.com and we'll get with Dan to make sure we answer. We'll make him you. type all that. Yeah, I, I'd love to. Or, I would. <laughs> we'll, we'll have him do a selfie video and send it to you. I might take a. Oh, no, yeah. It yeah. They could totally send it to my email address. Uh, you guys or whatever. That'd be great. I'd love it. We, we uh, promise that you'll learn something. I guarantee it. That's true. <laughs> so, Mark, what do you got for Dan? So, we're going to pass them around so we all get to ask a little bit. All right. These, we're going to put you on the hot seat, Dan. So, I'm done. these I'm are, aren't really whiskey uh, involved questions. They're more about the personality so that everybody on the 74 people that are watching right now get to know you uh, behind the scenes. You're part of the industry. You're part of what they drink. And we want to know what makes Dan go. So um, <laughs> I'll start it off with, with this question and I'll pass this one around. Um, Dan, is the glass half empty or half full? Ooh. <laughs> um, I, you know, in the past year, I have learned aggressively to appreciate what I have. Um, uh, I, I had the, uh, I'm not sharing too much here. I, I had a cancer scare uh, about a year ago. Uh, and uh, since that time, it's been half full um, uh, consistently, uh, just looking around at all the things that I, I uh, am aggressively thankful for. Uh, my my mindset has shifted a lot away from man. I I want this too. Man, ain't this great? So I, I'd say half. Very good. Good good, good, good answer. answer. It's a great Next answer. Up. Next up, what did you want to be when you grow up, or what do you want to be when you grow uh, up? I you know uh, I went to music school. I, uh, I I play drums. I've played drums since I was thirteen. Uh, I left school to be in a rock band. Uh, my my entire plan was to live on a tour bus uh, and and make music. And, and we had an independent label there for a while and, and a recording studio and that was coming together and then it all went to hell in a handbasket. But uh, that was the plan to begin with, was, uh, uh, was a, a global uh, uh, tour bus dwelling uh, rock pig. <laughs> nice. oh, that's, that's a great answer. It's, it's a good segue to me since you and I are basically the same past. Uh, so uh -huh. I'll, I'll ask the next question. So, what do you drink when you are not drinking whiskey? As a matter of fact, oh, uh, <laughs> dang it. Uh, not not good, yes. <laughs> um, Beer, uh, lots and lots of beer. Um, I am a, a big fan. Uh, I actually sat for the. Uh, the um, certified Cicerone exam and did not pass it. It's a very, very difficult exam. Um, but I love beer a lot. Um, wine, of course, uh, we've got, a, got quite a lot of wine sitting around the house, but I, it, my knee jerk is probably to reach for a beer. And I, it, oddly enough, uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the syrupy or the, the, um, the barley wines and, and uh, imperial stouts and uh, that kind of stuff. I tend to go a little bit lighter. I love those things. I tend to go a little bit lighter um, uh, with uh, saisons, Belgian farmhouse sales, things like that. I love them. Cool, yeah, very good. Yeah. You're into all of He's it. He's a man. geek on that too. <laughs> yeah. really love his answer. <laughs> so, I mean, you used to travel. Uh, I did. We all did. Uh, what was your favorite city or country that you visited for your job? Yeah, the country, of course, would be Scotland. Um, uh, <laughs> but, uh, the city, it's it's very difficult, and this this particular city has its has its issues. But New Orleans is a town that um, predates the U.S., and you can kind of you can feel its ancientness, even though, I mean, ancient by real ancient standards, it is, uh, but you know, uh, Antoine's and places, you know, the places that have just been there so long that it, that it makes you understand that something existed before America did. Um, uh, and the, and the cultural influence from, from uh, other nations around the world, the culinary scene, uh, second another uh, the cocktail scene, absolutely amazing. The, the the quarter has its challenges. Uh, the whole city has its challenges, uh, but there is, I've never I've never been anywhere quite like New Orleans. All right, Very one nice. more hot seat question. Pretty simple. It does come back to whiskey a little bit, but um, not knowing, we never mentioned to the the viewers how many years you've been doing this. But of mm -hmm. the years that you've been doing this, what's your favorite whiskey memory? Oh. Oh man, um, I had a chance, and this was this was early on, um, and I was I was still sort of mind blown that they'd ever given me the job in the first place, and completely starstruck <laughs> by by guys like you know Dr. Bill and and places like uh, Glamorgy had only existed in my mind uh, until that point, and I found myself during my initial training uh, working there. Uh, and they gave me a, a week and a, and a hard hat and some steel toed shoes and a high vis jacket and put me to work uh, at Glenmo for a week. 
uh, and it was an absolute mind scrambler. I had a, I had a, it was like winning a sweepstakes. Uh, but I remember part of my training was uh, the, it was Dr. Bill and myself uh, in the tasting room at the visitor center, tasting back through as far back as we had access to. And I'm just wow. taking absolutely scribbly notes uh, and and filling my head full of all of this, you know, this just this beam of information coming from Bill. And I sat there and for a minute I was like, this isn't real life. <laughs> this can't be happening. Uh, but yeah, one on one with Bill tasting through the portfolio during my training at Glamorangy, in Glamorangy. That uh, it, it, a close second, we got to go to Iceland. Uh, uh, we chipped some uh, glacier off of a glacier. Uh, and I got to drink uh, a signet with a chunk of glacier in it. Oh, um, that's pretty which cool. Was, and the, the glacier, uh, the guy that was on the on our tour had kind of estimated the age of the glacier, and the glacier was uh, that chunk of glacier was older than the distillery. Uh, so oh, it, it oh, felt yeah. like, holy cats, this just isn't a thing that happens. And it, for everything, for every that's spreadsheet cool. and for every for every crab egram that you get in your inbox, there are those moments that make it all absolutely beyond worth it. That's fantastic. Right on. Those are great memories. <laughs> so, yeah. Where uh, where can people cross paths with you in the next year? I know that there's some uh, new and yeah. things that you wanted you maybe can't talk about what's coming out. But what's uh, what's on the horizon? Where can we see? Where can we get a hold of you? Um, maybe we're not going to cross paths, but can they can they reach you via yes. email or what's what's yes, going on so we can leave people with good stuff? Yeah, um, I launched my own website, uh, glenmodan.com. Uh, you can certainly reach me there. You can uh, subscribe to my newsletter there. Uh, the newsletter is a, is a weekly letter. A newsletter comes out on Tuesdays. Uh, from time to time, it, essentially anybody that signs up for the newsletter is going to find out before anyone in the social media universe if there is going to be, is I'll release the newsletter um, either every Tuesday or the day of uh, the press embargo on a new release which is coming up pretty soon. Uh, so the newsletter folks will be the first to know about that. Um, uh, I've got a, a, a podcast called Whiskey in the Arts. It's on uh, Spotify. It's it's on a bunch of different podcast uh, uh, media, uh, but it's definitely on uh, Spotify podcasts on whatever that's called. Um, uh, the yeah, It's on Anchor, uh, yeah. Whiskey in the Arts, uh, Whiskey with no E, Whiskey in the Arts podcast. Uh, that's a blast. It's a look at um, the 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 communication circuit that's closed when something is created and then consumed uh the creator and the consumer sort of uh, become one for a minute and and are inside mm -hmm. each other's heads so we look at that through the prism of music and and whiskey and the and the visual oh, arts cool. literature yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's a lot of fun uh my email address is uh, is dan dot curl c r o w e l l at lamorangeusa.com uh, and uh, so anytime anybody wants to drop uh, any kind of messages my way, either through the website, through my email address, uh, we'll probably start being in public in the in September's and beyond. Uh, so awesome. whiskey That's fests are cool. likely, whiskey X may happen as well, uh, but we'll definitely be there for those. Uh, Tales of the Cocktails, tough to say right now, uh, uh, Portland Cocktail Week those things may happen as well, but, uh, that's, that is the, that's my so. forecast to the best so. of my ability. Awesome. Me too. Man, that was awesome. I, I we kind of need to give you 60 seconds to catch your breath. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm worried your wife's going to be upset with us because you, <laughs> you choked that out. Long? I breathe into my ears and out. <laughs> that's all good. No comment. Uh, hey Dan, thanks so much for hanging with us. Uh, thanks, stay guys. backstage. We're going to talk to you for a little bit more, yeah, we'll but, uh, thanks for so much oh, for being yeah. on the show. Dan, oh, it's my buddy, pleasure. thanks Thank for uh, sharing you. everything with everybody, man. You got we it appreciate all appreciate it. Certainly. That's my pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. You got See it. See you in a second. So, guys. Wow. What a, that was a brain buster of stuff. Man, I knew it was going to be that way. I do <laughs> know so much about right. you just can't. I'm like, just go. And like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you, take you notes. Know, just wisdom, whiskey wisdom in every footstep he takes when he's walking. You know, you're just like, geez, man, he's dripping. Oh, you <laughs> dropped this. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, awesome stuff, though. Really cool. We yep. did ask questions that the, the viewers wanted to know. I hope we got to the, the bulk of them. And if there's, like Drew said, if there's any outstanding, yeah. shoot an email to us, shoot an email to him, one way or the other. We, we'll definitely make sure they get in the comments so everyone gets to, to 
hear the answer. But it's good um, to see some new faces on here. I don't recognize half the faces, so the time slot's nice to see some different pe people, you know, European, yep. etc. So it's good to see you guys. Thanks for joining us. And seeing a lot of the familiar faces, I do want to shout out a couple, and uh, not no names, but I really appreciate um, the knowledge that gets shared in the chat. So you guys are asking and answering questions and yep. it's really helpful you're always providing extra information it's a great community good color commentary that goes along with the discussion uh, so appreciate you can't find this in. information on the no. this is general just great information you can geek out on this stuff man. Totally. So, for, for hours and hours i can't wait so, to hear the podcast right so who's next week we're not sure exactly what's going on we got another guest maybe we got some pretty cool things for the patrons we got this do-it-yourself blind dram that we're going to be doing blender blenders something yep. whatever so that's going to be very going to call it Right. So, so that's that coming up. Yep. And then we do have some reviews still coming up, like this guy. I mean, I, it's not fair that we're going to review it after we've had it because it is it's, it's pretty, it's pretty good. <laughs> good. And some new Four Dummy series coming out as well, we which we talked a damn about, by the way. Yeah, so. actually, we do have yeah. something. All right. Yeah. Guys, so, good show. Cheers, man. It was Thanks, great to see everybody on a Sunday. Guys, till next, next time. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. cheers.